good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Characteristics of a Highly Effective Adult Education Program. Our generous sponsor today is Burlington English, and we have Mr. Robert Breitbart on with us today, who's going to share a few words. Robert? I think you're on mute. You are it. Thank you, James. It's my first <laughs> time doing this, but thanks to everybody uh, for uh, coming on board today. Thank you to Sharon Bonnie and the co board and James and everybody behind the scenes. Uh, but thank you also. You are in for a genuine, genuine treat. This may be one of the top presentations uh, that I've seen in, in my 10 years with Burlington and 30 years in the field. So I promise you that, um, and do me a favor, if you have any colleagues or anybody who's not able to join today, of course, we'll make sure we put in the, in the chat the link that this is gonna be archived. So if you were, somebody wasn't able to make it, I know you definitely wanna uh, view this again and see it. So again, thanks to Coabe and from all of us at Burlington English, it's so, so much fun uh, participating and sponsoring these. So one of the biggest things, characteristics I'm seeing around the country of uh, programs taking things to the next level is understanding, you know, how early, uh, maybe the minute our students walk in the door, how early can we start, you know, particularly for our ESL learners, let them know that, hey, this is more than just a place to learn English, you know, stick with us. And uh, we've got things such as, as you see on the screen, we can help you get into, get into a job, get in job training, get a better job. And so in Burlington English, uh, no need to run around to 10 different resources. It's all in one place. So in our Burlington core, as you can see on the screen, we start introducing uh, students to the concepts of things like preparing for a new career, talking with a career counselor, and uh, really building uh, something and exploring things early on, um, particularly seeing how it's um, uh, teacher appreciation, uh, you know, week. We want to make teachers' lives early. So one of the biggest things I hear around the country is, you know, Robert, I'm, I feel great being an adult ESL teacher, but I wasn't a trained career counselor. And I understand that's a critical part of what we do. So at Burlington English, we want to put all the pieces and all the resources in teachers' hands right away so that they can, you know, do contextualized instruction. Let's learn English, but also get ready for that, that first career, that next career. Let's build that career pathway. And... Uh, you know, making sure that just like any of us who probably, whether it was high school or college, uh, changed our decisions, changed our majors, how can we help our, our adult learners make better decisions before they get into training programs? And so this is really neat. We, we help teachers, help students, you know, explore all the 16 Department of Labor career clusters, really start making, making sound choices. And what I love about what you see on the screen is this is part of our career pathway portfolio that every student's going to build uh, a digital portfolio that's going to follow them through, you know, all their learning with you, and they make great decisions. And we want to practice random acts of andragogy. Let's get our adults feeling like adults and active partners in their own learning. So as you can see, this is what they build when they're with you, and we make teachers' lives really, really easy about helping students know. What's life after ESL? What are what are some of my next choices? And uh, you know, we want universal desert, design for learning. We want students involved and excited, and and again, part of building their their future. So we'd love to share more with you. So I've got amazing set of colleagues all over the country that would love to help. So please reach out to us, BurlingtonEnglish.com/contact. So with that, without further ado. We'll turn it over to, like I said, I guarantee you, one of the best webinars you'll, you'll see all year. Over to you and James and Laura. Thank you, Robert. We appreciate your partnership and your enthusiasm and everything you're doing in the world of adult education. It's truly appreciated. So thank you. All right. Our presenter today is Laura Pastore. As a state, Indiana regularly performs at high levels on outcomes such as MSGs, certifications, and HSC credentials. This can be attributed to strong programs and directors at the local level. Over the course of several months, Indiana state leadership brought together directors from a variety of high performing programs to learn their secrets and to understand what practices were instrumental to their success. 
Their responses were then used to create a guide for program excellence. So if you, I see some folks already have, if you wanna say hello in the chat box, let us know where you're calling in from today. That would be great. If you have questions during Laura's presentation, you can submit those in the Q&A box. And with that, I'll hand it over to her. Thank you. Thanks, James. Uh, really a huge thank you to James and the whole co team for putting this together. And a big thank you to Robert Breitbart and Burlington English for sponsoring. And I just wanna give a shout out to Marilyn Pizzullo, who is the state director for Indiana Adult Education. Um, such great support for this presentation. And I really appreciate you guys taking time out of your day to be here to um, share some information. Hopefully uh, this is going to be helpful, not only at the state, the program, but every level. And once again, um, this is the uh, through the lens of Indiana. So we realize this is somewhat subjective and a little bit influenced by our own uh, state priorities and goals, but hopefully there's definitely some universal metrics and data points and, and practices that you'll be able to use um, in any state at any level. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump on in. So we have a couple of objectives today. And um, of course, the uh, characteristics of a highly effective adult education program is the title, but that is evidenced through a new initiative in Indiana called the Programs of Excellence. And so hopefully you'll leave this webinar with a better understanding of what the Programs of Excellence is, uh, the indicators as mentioned in the title that are um, evidenced as a program being highly effective, and then some of the evaluative metrics that we were using for each indicator to help us better understand, okay, we get that this indicator is important, but how do we determine effectiveness within that indicator? And then the overall benefits of a program level recognition initiative. And that's what the programs of excellence is. It is a recognition program or yeah, a recognition program for the provider level. So I, I know there's several of you here. There's a couple hundred, I think roughly 400. Um, and I, I would like for you to take a moment and scan the QR code and we'll do a quick poll to get started. So I have a better understanding of who is in the audience today. Um, I know this is a very limited poll. So if you're other, that's great. But if you're a local adult education program, state staff or workforce board, oh, wow, great. Um, if we can keep going on that for a few moments. Um, very cool, okay. 80, 20, okay, not, okay, all right, we have an other there. This is like a, like, a, like a little race here, this is fun. Okay, we'll give it a few more moments and let that settle. But I am very, very excited to see that we are predominantly speaking with local adult education programs because that is absolutely um, an intended audience for this information. And it looks like we're settling out there. Um, so thank you for participating in that poll. And I'm really happy it worked because this is my first time using Slido.com. So uh, yay, glad that was able to, to, to work. All right, so why is the programs of excellence important to Indiana? And the very, very simple reason is because while we know at a state level, Indiana performs very well at an, on, a, on a national stage in the MSGs um, with total HSEs, with IETWEI outcomes, the only reason we do perform that well at a state level is because we have a network of incredible providers and directors and teachers and life coaches at that local community level who are doing excellent work. And really when we looked around and thought, man, we, we do a good job of promoting Indiana as a national leader, but maybe we don't do a great job of promoting our individual programs, the people at the program provider community level who are making such a difference every single day. And that is the primary reason that we put this initiative together is to really be able to recognize and celebrate programs that are doing an exceptional job of serving their community. So of course we had to build a framework out of what does that recognition look like? What is a program of excellence? But as many of you probably have gone through this in, in the recent past or will in, in the near future, when you're making a case, especially at the legislative level, at the state level, um, it's really important to be able to have a common language and to be able to promote what work you're doing. And putting this framework together and creating this initiative is one step in that process for us. Um, I'll touch on that legislative process as we get to the end of this presentation, but Indiana, 
had not had a funding increase for nearly 20 years at the state level for adult education. And once again, we've done a great job at the state level, but a lot of politics is local as well. So that's a secondary piece that we really want to keep in the back of our mind. Not only do our local programs deserve and, and earn that recognition, but we have got to do a better job of being able to explain and celebrate and promote and advocate um, at all different levels of the legislative, legislative um, process in Indiana. So I'm gonna go on to the next reason is this programs of excellence created a guide for new directors. Um, I'm sure Indiana is not alone in that we see a decent amount of turnover with our adult education directors. In fact, we look at about 20% turnover in the director position at the provider level. And for anyone who's been new to adult education, um, as a director, you know it is a very steep learning curve. So putting this initiative together builds out a framework of what are your core um, focus areas. If you wanna build or create or continue a successful program, this is more of a roadmap and a blueprint of here's where you really need to have your eye on the ball if you are a, a new director coming into an adult education program. So we built out best practices and included state and federal goals and metrics, but really it was to provide, like I said, that framework, that rubric to give people a basic understanding of what are really the critical pieces if you wanna be successful in adult education? And then lastly, provide supports and resources for programs because we have several programs that are really strong in certain areas, but maybe have a little bit of a gap in other areas and being able to provide additional supports and resources is something that even the most experienced directors can appreciate. So that's, these were kind of the primary reasons that we put together the programs of excellence. So how was this developed? And um, a little bit of background, I've been with the Indiana State staff for about 18 months now, and I love being at the state level. But prior to that, I was um, a local administrator in a very large urban adult education program on the north side of Indianapolis, serves approximately 1,700 students per year. And I was in that role for um, almost 12 years. So I really grew to have not only a passion, but a, a deep appreciation for what it takes to run a program, especially a large program with a diverse student population and lots of different service areas. And so we knew that if we were going to put this together, that having that voice from directors out in the field would be a critical, critical piece. And um, below is a list of the directors who participated in a work group. It lasted approximately three months. We met every other week. There was a pretty significant investment in time on their part and on the state team parts um, from the Indiana State team. It was Dr. Jerry Hafner, myself, and uh, Amy Raymer, the professional de development coordinator. And you can see the list of directors. And we were really trying to be thoughtful and intentional in um, having directors from multiple areas of the state geographically, different sizes of programs. We know it is a very different experience to, um, to run a program that has 100 adult learners compared to one that has 1,500 or closer to 2,000. Um, and then the years of experience, um, making sure we included newer directors so we would have their perspective as well as people with a lot of experience. Um, Rob Moore had been in the adult education business for a long time. He recently retired and is part of the uh, mentor program in Indiana now. So he was a, a guiding voice in this project and I can't thank him and um, Todd DeLay, Lauren Bell, Connie McCollum, Megan Schaff, Nikki Nolting, Christine McIntyre Gray, Caroline Foster and Adrian Carroll. I just can't thank them enough for, for giving of their time, their knowledge and their perspective for this project. So let's take a, a quick poll. I wanna, I wanna know, does your state have a recognition program for adult education programs? And it's okay to say not sure, but if we can get some um, audience input, okay, I'm seeing a no, not sure. Yes, that is awesome. I'd love to hear from you if you have yes, because we can always learn from what's going on in other places. So a lot of not sure and no. Okay, really helpful. If you are a yes, I would love to connect with you because once again, this is a new initiative in Indiana and I'm sure there's great work going on in other states. Um, but once again, we're just gonna share the Indiana lens today. Perfect. And we're leveling out there. Great. Thank you. 
So 80% is no, we're not sure. And 20% yes, very good, really helpful to know. So in Indiana, um, this is how we went about putting this together. We were looking at research. We did a lot of research, hours and hours of research, looking at rubrics and frameworks for accountability in the education space. And one of the very obvious places to start is at the K through 12 level because of through No Child Left Behind and ESSA, Every Child Succeeds Act, those legislative um, initiatives have mandates for accountability. So we looked at every single state. We went to every single state and tried to understand how they put that accountability rubric in place. And there's lots of different ways to do it. They had dashboards and report cards and pillars of support and indices. Um, so that just gave us a starting point to, to better understand what was already going on in this space. Then we looked at the American School Counseling Association. They have a, a, a rubric that is called RAMP, Recognized Ask a Model Program, where you can be a gold star uh, counseling program at the school level. They recognize that. And then we went to what I consider as a sister program or um, a familial program, CTE, as part of OCTE. So the career and technical education. Um, and through the Association of Career and Technical Education, they had a quality CTE program of study framework to designate highly effective CTE centers. So we spent time looking at that. And then we jumped into the adult education space and NRS had a module on their professional development website um, talking about report cards that was a little bit older. And then really one of the core research pieces that helped shape this initiative was the Adult Learner 360, 10 Principles for Effectively Serving Adults. And uh, Rob Moore brought this to the table and, and we all spent a lot of time sifting through these different domains. And you can see there's partnerships and teaching and learning and assessment and student support systems and life planning and outreach. So this was really the jumping off point where we put a lot of time trying to dissect which was what was in these different areas. They called them principles, and we really focused more on the term domains. So we spent a lot of time. Um, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of various viewpoints, which is the best way to try and figure out how to come to the most effective conclusion. But we started you know, with those 10 principles. Then we went to eight domains. We narrowed it to six. And then we ended up with four. And really the student and program outcomes was a set of the core metrics. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned before, outcomes is really important in Indiana. There are several players in the adult learner landscape in Indiana. So we have our traditional adult education system where we have about 55 uh, different providers, including subcontractors, and we serve approximately 20,000 students a year. Then we have adult high schools. And you know they sort of have a different uh, delivery model, serve a little bit of a different audience. Um, and you know we really have found that in our state, we need to do a really good job of promoting the exceptional work that is happening at the local level. And so putting student and program outcomes at the center of this became kind of a natural conclusion from all of us in the director work group and at the state level. So absolutely critical student instruction and services, program management, outreach and partnerships, very important parts. And, and once again, we, we spent a lot of time hashing out what domains were critical to, to program and student success, but it all fed into that core group of metrics, student and program outcomes. So this is really the key slide of this whole presentation. If you wanna think about the characteristics or we call them indicators within the framework of a highly effective adult education program, this is it. This is the four domains and then the six indicators within each of those domains. And trust me, there are no clear lines for some of these different indicators. And we went back and forth in which domain they should be in. And there were other um, indicators that didn't make the cut, but um, these are the ones we all settled on as a state and local director team, as far as being the core components of being able to successfully provide adult education at the program level. I wanna give a disclaimer here. Um, once again, this is really looking at a program level, the adult education program level. Um, it, it has 
different indicators that impact the classroom, of course, but it really is a little bit of a step higher as far as perspective, um, maybe not the ground level, maybe about the 5,000 feet level. Um, Dr. Jerry Hafner, our division director here, often says state staff looks at things from a 30,000 level feet. And I would say directors um, are much closer to the ground, but have a little bit of a higher perspective. And that's really where this rubric was geared at, is at the director or program level. Um, so that's where we're taking, um, taking that perspective from as far as how it was built out and why it was put together in this way. So I'm not going to be able to go through each of these indicators. That would be a very, very long webinar, way longer than any of us are prepared for. So I'm going to pull a couple of these different indicators out from each of the domains and walk through what the framework looks like, just so everybody can have that information. So the domain components have an indicator, a description, and that is what are we measuring, and then an evaluative metric an evaluative criteria. How are we measuring it? So if we look at our student and program outcomes, here are our indicators. Enrollment, measurable skill gains, high school credentials, IET slash career certifications, WEI, which is Workforce Education Initiative, and it's what most people would consider employer partnerships, and the new skills progressions and milestones, and then distance learning. These are all very objective metrics because there are numerical values attached to each of them for Indiana programs. And it's a simple, were they met? Yes or no. I'll get into a little bit more detail in a moment, but Indiana provides enrollment goals for each of the programs. Um, and, and we had to do that because we had fallen below 20,000 for the first time in our state's history, as most people had with the pandemic. We bottomed out around 17,000 students. Um, the following year, we got up to 19,430, but we took a very intentional and strategic approach at the state level to help give our programs realistic, but um, increased program enrollment goals because we knew we needed to get back above that 20,000. And really we needed to get back to that pre-pandemic number of 25,000. So enrollment is a key metric in Indiana that each program has a specific goal based on what they've done in the past, what their current capacity is, where there is opportunity within the community or community need. So there were a lot of components that went into the enrollment goal, but that is a real key piece. Measurable skill gains, MSGs, that's on our table fours. That is obviously a federally um, given goal. And that is something, of course, that is consistent across all the states. High school credentials, so those HSEs, that is a very objective goal. IET slash career certifications um, in the 2021-22 NRS data that was just released, Indiana had 1,849. I think that places us third in the nation. So this is a very developed and growing area in adult education services. And just, just as a side note, this is something that sets our adult education programs um, it gives us a leg up when we compare to other types of adult learner um, options in the state of Indiana. Our, our um, focus of economic development and career certifications, and that ties into our WEI, which is employer partnerships. Um, we have over 100 documented and formalized agreements with employers throughout the state. That is something we're growing and we are leveraging those milestones and still skills progressions. So that is a focal point here in Indiana. And then lastly is distance learning. And distance learning may seem like a little bit of an outlier, but we've done a lot of research and we find a very strong correlation between increased distance learning and increased MSGs. So that is one of the goals that Indiana puts out for our programs each year. We started a couple of years ago when 30% of our students participated in distance learning. It is now up to around 45%, which is our goal. We are about 1% above our goal line right now. And it will probably be 50% next year because um, as Robert said at the beginning, getting students connected, giving them the opportunity to do the work above and beyond the classroom is a key metric and success that we found in Indiana. So we really try and push and um, make that one of the goals for our programs. So when we look at student instructions and instruction and services, this is where it gets subjective. And I'm just gonna say it, you could have 
libraries of books on instructional strategy. So boiling this down to a description and an evaluative metric was not easy, um, as was some of the other indicators. But Rob Moore once again brought um, a really great um, evaluative tool to our, uh, our work group. It's called the Marzano scale, and it's often used in K through 12 accountability and evaluation systems. And it really is a level of implementation as opposed to a, a measurement. It is how, how much are you implementing, in this case, best practice. So it starts at not using, goes all the way to applying. So instead of having an A, B, C, or D, or some kind of indices or some kind of grade, we really just use a level of implementation. So it's, a, it's more of a constructive, supportive, evaluative metric as opposed to a, a, a critique of what's going on. It's just, are you using this in your program? Um, so that's how we built out the evaluative metric for something that is subjective. So we're going to we're going to hone in and I'm going to show you what the indicators the 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 what we are measuring on this next slide and it's going to be a lot of information. We're not going to go through all of it, but I just wanted to show you what that looks like in our framework. So student instruction and services and I'm going to go to the next slide and we're going to hone in on just two of these. Curriculum and retention and persistence. So description. Program uses curriculum that aligns to the college and career readiness standards and state approved assessments. That's it. That's what we came up with. And trust me, we spent a lot of time honing in on these descriptions in the work group. And the evaluative criteria is program can demonstrate that the curriculum is aligned to assessments, um, our HSE assessment, and then an online learning resources component. That was really important with curriculum. When we look at retention and persistence, in very simple terms, it's are you keeping people and are they staying long enough to either be assessed or meet their goals? So that is what retention and persistence. So they can document student retention from orientation and demonstrate student persistence, whether if it's um, increasing English skills through NRS assessments or going all the way to career training or HSE completion. So, you know, that is, is kind of the big picture. When you get to a granular level of evaluative criteria, we start to get into the NRS tables. And I'll get into that more here in a moment. So curriculum, um, this impacts everything we do. If a program is not using an effective correlating aligned curriculum, they're really gonna struggle to best serve their students. And we all know this intuitively, but as a new director coming into a program, or in the case of a lot of our programs in Indiana, programs that are expanding for the first time into serving ELL programs, especially in our more rural communities, this has been a challenge and they really want resources and they want information. And they um, need us to lay out what does it mean to be effective in, in selecting curriculum and building it out at a level that is highly effective in supporting students. So you're going to see the term core curriculum throughout every level. So let's just jump into that. Core curriculum, and this is once again, we sent this out to our field as a whole, but we sent it out to these directors and we all sat around and said, let's, let's pool our resources. Let's bring our teachers in. Let's be as comprehensive knowing we're not going to be fully comprehensive as we can be with what is being used in, in the field right now. So here's our ABE core curriculum resources. This is the list that was generated. Here's the ELL core curriculum resources. And now we're gonna bounce back to that evaluative um, piece. So not using means, you know, they may have, you know, some other books, something that was passed on to them from K through 12, especially from the ELL space. They may have lots of great online material, which is nothing against those online resources. You can supplement the core curriculum all you want, but we needed that backbone of core curriculum resources to make sure that instruction was aligned to the common core standards and then, um, our assessments so that our students can make progress. So if they can't document, they're, they're using those core curriculum resources. And then you get into beginning where they use two or fewer, then developing where you start to get into the online curriculum or software programs, and then really applying. This is what effectiveness looks like. Program can evidence use of three or more core curriculum resources, at least one online curriculum or software program, and supplemental instructional resources program actively seeks 
new instructional resources. That is where you are effective in making sure that you cover that curriculum piece. When we look at retention and persistence, this means they are staying with programs long enough to make that progress. Um, and, and this impacts so many pieces of what we do. So a conversion rate is a very simple rate of using uh, information at the program level that where you, they track students who come in and register versus those who go to orientation versus those who enroll in class versus those who go on to take an assessment or complete their goal within the program. So that is table 2A, your reportable individuals. So those are students who have less than 12 hours compared to table four where they have 12 hours. And when we look at conversion rates and separation rates, separation rates are um, column H of table four. So these are all the different components of understanding retention and persistence, that conversion and separation rates. And whether a program understands those different resources and metrics, that becomes the not using all the way to applying where not only can a program understand and calculate conversion and separation rates, but they can give us interventions and look at it not only at the program level, but at the class level, because this is different at the program versus the class level. We also coin critical control points. That is a place where we know we're gonna lose students. So whether it's when students call in, or whether or not they show up to orientation, whether they make it from orientation to a classroom, whether they make it to 12 hours, whether they get to that first assessment, those are critical control points. So program management. So we've gone from that student instruction to the next level, which is program management. These are the indicators within that domain, and these are subjective and objective. So fiscal management in Indiana, we are very focused on making sure that our programs spend the state and federal dollars that are allocated to them. So how often do they reimburse? Are they fully getting reimbursed for all of their funds? That goes into an objective criteria to understand what, whether you are highly effective in the fiscal management area. Then we look at class management. And this impacts so much of what we do. It speaks to whether or not a program offers lots of different options. This is all about options. So a program that is not being effective in the area of class management maybe has a static schedule. Maybe it's just based on what they've done before versus you know, attendance patterns. Um, and, and not using means that they don't have a full understanding of how many students are in attendance or whether or not they have a significant wait list. So you can go all the way down through on um, class management, and this is an effective, whether or not a program is effective in this area. The more effective programs are going to schedule classes based on student need and their background. So this is where it comes into really understanding who your students are, what your community need is, and making sure that you adjust classes as that need shifts. An effective program is very aware of what the average class attendance is or regular class attendance is in different classes, monitors class enrollment, and they work to minimize program wait lists. So we go all the way to the highly effective and applying. This is gonna be a program, and I know it's harder for smaller programs, I absolutely get that, but even in small programs, just understanding where the need is, is the critical piece of effectiveness. So the variation and offering different options for your students, there is an online availability. And we all went through this in the pandemic. Some of our programs said, online's great. Some of them said, this is not working for us or our students. As a state, Indiana has created an Indiana online only program where our provider out of Evansville does statewide service for all online students because they've got the technology, the skill set, the knowledge and expertise to serve in this area. So we direct all of the students statewide. If a program, a local program isn't comfortable with online, it goes to that Indiana online. We have the same thing for ELL. We have an Indiana online ELL that goes through our Monroe County provider. So once again, back at applying, there's an online option, alternative schedules. There's a hybrid option a lot of the time. And the program is so in tune 
with where classes are ebbing and flowing, which class can take more students. And then they are very, very effective at looking at which students can be transitioned to another class. And, and, and this is if you have leveled classes in ELL or ABE. I'm sure everybody's had that situation where you have the world's best teacher and no student ever wants to leave because it's that's where their friends are, that's where they feel comfortable. But at a program level, class management means that you're very aware of when there are points that that kind of graduation between classes or that transition to different classes takes place and is a regular occurrence. Okay, last domain. We're doing good on time. Awesome. Um, we're going to take questions at the end of the presentation, just as we get through all this. Um, but we are into the last domain, which is outreach and partnerships. And there are some critical pieces to this domain. And it really is very subjective. Understanding community need, marketing, digital presence and integration, orientations, community partnerships, and workforce partnerships. Um, as we all know, adult education, at least in Indiana, is not funded at the level it probably deserves to be. I, I can't imagine that that is different in other states. But building out those community partnerships and leveraging grassroots um, facilities and, and um, collaborations is how we extend the funding we get. So the outreach and partnerships is such a critical, critical piece of, of adult education in Indiana. And really those workforce partnerships are the same thing. We are able to have the impact in adult education that we do in Indiana because of the partnerships our individual providers leverage at the community level with faith-based partners, workforce partners, education partners, community partners, literacy groups, workforce boards, um, if there's a type of partnership, you name it, um, it's probably uh, been established in Indiana and I'm sure with, with other states throughout the country, but this is such a critical piece of what we do. Looking at one piece of this, and this became very, very important with the pandemic, is digital presence and integration and making sure that our programs understand the importance of that digital presence. As we've seen so many students um, leave high school, become disconnected in high school, and we are seeing our demographic get younger in the ABE space for that high school equivalency, they access information digitally. So not only do we have to create awareness in that digital space, but we have to be able to communicate and bring them on board in that way. So that's where we start to look at websites, um, social media, proprietary digital platforms, and in Indiana, we recently brought on an outreach coordinator. Her name is Camelia Manring, and um, she is Generation Z, which means she understands social media and the digital presence way better than someone in my generation understands. So having that person either as a volunteer at a program level or in a paid position part-time or at the state level is such a critical part of supporting programs get better and be effective in the digital presence and integration. Five years ago, this wouldn't have been one of the indicators, but it absolutely is now. So jumping to that applying, um, a program has a website or proprietary digital platform that is searchable and accessible by mobile devices. And this is where a lot of local programs get hung up sometimes and making sure things are designed with mobile devices in mind. Multiple social media accounts at the state level, we have a social media library that just provides that extra level support because we know our local programs, our, our directors and our teachers wear so many hats that it is not easy for them to have time to design that. So a social media library at a state or at a, at a regional level is extremely helpful. And then offering those online learning opportunities that are part of the structure of classes and are regular and consistent. Um, students being able to register for classes online. And this is a really big one at highly effective programs. Accommodations are available for those students in the online and digital space language barriers. Indiana has seen a huge increase in our ELL student population. It's gone up um, significantly. It used to be about 21-25% of our student population, and now we're right around 34%, which obviously lags the, the national percentage of about 50%, but we are seeing a big increase. And making sure we have those 
language translation devices um, or plugins that are part of that digital presence is really important. And then screen reader accessibility. That is a huge piece for a lot of the digital presence for our programs. Okay, so I went through that pretty quick, but I wanted to give you guys an idea of what the totality of the framework is, but get granular on a couple of those indicators. And now that we've kind of gone through what the basic core components are of that program, a lot of programs, when we presented this to them at our annual conference um, about a year ago, we're like, uh, actually about nine months ago, we're like, okay, how do I get this? How can I be recognized? And once again, we came back to that student and program outcomes. Um, if anyone's been in the K through 12 space and has to show that they're highly effective in an accountability or evaluation system, when I was um, in a career and technical center, or a career and technical education center, they put it on the teachers to submit all this documentation. And, and I have to be honest, when we first put this together, um, I thought, okay, we're gonna have our program submit information on um, each of these indicators. And one of the, the directors said, uh, Laura, do you actually want people to be recognized for this or not? And that's when we said, we pulled back and said, okay, if you hit those student and program outcomes, that's when we're going to recognize you. So this is how we put it together. Oops, that they needed to um, just meet the metrics on the student and program outcomes as that was the core piece of this framework. So one more poll for you guys. I wanna know of those six different metrics right now, actually, I think we have five on this page because these are the five common ones. Which do you think is most difficult for your program to meet? Okay, very good. Wow, lots of variation here. We'll give it a few more moments. Interesting. So I, IET and career certifications is definitely the top one. Measurable skill gains, workforce partnerships. Okay. We'll see if it can settle here in a moment. All right. Oh, still moving. This is really helpful. Yeah, IET and career certification, it's, it's a newer metric and that can be difficult to, to stand up and get going. But yeah, measurable skill gains, which of course IET career certifications play into. Really helpful. Okay, very good, thank you. So we, we decided that it wasn't, it wasn't required to meet all of those metrics because once again, we know programs are built differently and there's differences between rural, urban, small, large. So he said, meet both, meet enrollment and measurable skill gains. Make sure you meet those metrics and then be able to demonstrate hitting two of the four metrics in column B. And these are state goals that are given to our programs at the beginning of the year. So these are all objective numeric goals. And this is what it looks like. This is our first year, we'll see what it looks like. And of course we wanted to go back and look in the past and we said, okay, if we looked at our previous year data and put these metrics over on top of it, we saw 67% was our measurable skill goal from, from Octe in 21-22. And over half of our programs met that. So we knew that was a pretty big pool to start with. And meeting two of the three was difficult because we switched HSE um, vendors, providers. That was a tough one. We're still switching and adding, and now we have GED. So Indiana has gone through a lot of changes in that area. So we know that's a little bit of a challenge too, but I am estimating that we will have approximately 10 to 12, maybe upwards of 15 programs become a program of excellence. And once again, it, it's difficult because we wanna make sure that it's attainable, but we don't wanna make it so simple that it isn't meaningful. And we do have core metrics attached to this. We have state goals and federal goals that Indiana is, is tasked with hitting. So these are really um, very objective and measurable, um, but we'll see what happens. We're really excited. It's our first year. What does it mean? And we've only got a couple more slides and I think our timing's gonna be good to answer some questions and wrap up in just a few minutes. But what does it mean to be recognized? 
let me go back to recognition in the form of a certificate and press release from DWD because Indiana Adult Education is housed in the Department of Workforce Development. And this is critical for our programs because once again, it gives them the opportunity to advocate, to sell themselves, promote their excellent work and demonstrate that they are a highly effective program. And when we give this to them, we are going in front of their school board. We're encouraging them to go to their mayor, to any type of governing board, to reach out to their legislators. This is their opportunity to kind of stand on the rooftops and tell everybody about the incredible work they are doing that is verified from their state oversight agency. I would love for all of our programs to be a program of excellence, but once again, we have to tie it to objective metrics for it to be credible and verified. But if you are a program of excellence, our state staff, we said certificate and, and Jerry, um, Dr. Hafner had agreed to do a plaque. So we're going all out in Indiana, it's gonna be a plaque. And that is something that once again, we are going to encourage, support and be a part of communicating that excellent work they are doing in the adult education space in their community. This will be part of the IAACE Awards Banquet. The IAAC is the Indiana Association of Adult and Continuing Education, our membership. We will recognize these programs officially at the IAACE Awards Banquet. This program data will be reviewed. We at the state level will do the legwork to determine who is part of the program of excellence by August 31st of this year. Um, let's see, next slide. Okay. Yeah, I love a good quote, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up here with a good quote. But I also want to say that Indiana had the opportunity this year as part of our governor's recommendation to get a funding increase for the first time in almost 20 years. And so that went to our legislative body in um, January to increase Indiana adult education. And um, initially, we thought it was going to be a done deal because we had the governor's workforce cabinet. We had the governor supporting it. And then it got to our legislative body and something very unexpected happened as it often does. And um, our house of um, Indiana house, uh, which is a super majority of Republicans decided that maybe the money would be better spent somewhere else. And then it took all of our programs getting out and contacting their legislators. It took a unified effort of common language and promoting Indiana as a national leader for them to reach out to the legislators and um, miraculously, and if you understand what it's like to be in a super majority Republican state, we got our increase reinstated and um, it actually came out at the very end of the session that Indiana adult education after years and years and years of hard work as a national leader was able to get a budget increase, but it became so critically important and, um, and very apparent that we've got to do a much better job of talking about not only what we do at the state level, what our providers are doing at the local level and supporting them through this program, not only to increase their outcomes, increase their effectiveness, but to be able to promote it is going to be part of our um, strategy moving forward and how to increase opportunities in every area of legislation and funding. So that is why it's really, really important in Indiana. Um, how can this program be re replicated in other states? Um, the push to increase, increase enrollment, I know that's a federal um, OCTA, um, AIR vision and strategy. Uh, all, of, all states have federal MSG goals, HSCs are common metric. We are willing to share and, um, and provide any information on this program anybody is interested in, but importantly also is establishing mid-year benchmarks as a check-in point because programs, it's a long program year and establishing mid-year benchmarks for enrollment, for MSG gains. And in Indiana, we attach funding to those benchmarks. That is a critical piece in keeping people engaged and making sure people are on track. So those are a couple of ideas that, that we had that we wanted to share. And now I think, yeah, we're to the end. Woo, we made it with a few minutes to spare. So I'm gonna jump into the questions. Um, can the guide for new directors be shared? Absolutely. What MIS does management information system? Indiana uses a proprietary system called ENTERS. And um, 
the Indiana Technical Education Reporting System, and we actually share it with CTE at the high school level. And it is a critical piece, Catherine, that is a great question, because not only can the state access all these data points, we can create new data points. Um, one of the data points that we are creating um, was a language analysis. So we understand what new languages with our growing ELL population. But if you want more information on that proprietary system, I'd be happy to to provide it, my email address, I think is on the screen. Are these rubrics and program quality uh, available on your state website? Not yet, but they will be. So we are going to be able to share this rubric with you and I think we'll be able to put it on the COABE website uh, wherever this um, webinar is shared. We will make sure the documents are attached to it. What are uh, for professional development? Okay, I'd have to go in and look, but we can share that framework. In Indiana, do, do hybrid learning models include high flex learning? If so, are there indicators for these? We are at a little bit more um, relaxed. Um, some of our programs do hybrid. And so we leave that up to the program level, but it is a best practice. It is part of the framework and it is encouraged. So we have kind of different ex um, experimentation going out there, but we do not have um, framework around hybrids. Do you look at your program's ability to provide with digital literacy skills? Ooh, David, that is new. And um, I'm sure there are, there are some people on our staff who say that should be part of your indicators, but we have not gotten to a point where we are able to flush that out enough, but that is a great suggestion. Um, thank you. A 45% is that 45% of uh, participants are involved in some type of distance learning? Yes. Yes, it is a very basic distance learning definition. We do not put a minimum number of hours. It is there is distance learning that has occurred with that student. Um, I'm, I'm losing track of where I'm at with the questions. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go down to the bottom. Uh, do Indiana basic programs teach to the test or are they committed to teaching basic skills? I'm going to tell you both because we understand that we as a state, we have to show that progress. We have to demonstrate progress. One of the very best teachers I ever knew as a program administrator made sure she aligned her instruction to the assessment and then she taught them everything else they needed to know and there was time within those federal guidelines. But you have to know your assessments. You have to know your assessments inside and out. Um, how many state grantees are there in Indiana? Okay, I think I'm, I'm at the wrong end. I'm getting a little bit lost. James might be able to, to help me here. Um, how many state grantee programs are there in Indiana? We have 45 fiscal agents and 54 total uh, providers, including subcontractors. Is the recognition, okay, is the recognition conferred on achieving programs on an annual basis? Yes, Laura, that is um, what it's going to be. And we are starting in August or September of this year. Um, what type of IET programs are the most popular for your region? Okay, we have a variety, but healthcare is really big in our state. Logistics, Indiana, crossroads of America. Um, logistics is a big deal. So healthcare, we're looking at CNA, CMA. Um, we do welding. We do a decent amount of medical interpreting, which is a variation on medical with uh, um, English language learners where it's translation. Um, on average, how much are AE instructors paid? And do you have full-time? We have some full-time, but they are primarily part-time. I can tell you when you get into larger urban areas, that is going to range anywhere from $25 in smaller rural areas up to the urban areas, which is around $40 an hour. Um, oh, thank you, Lella. That's really nice. Thank you. Can I get a copy of the slides? I would like to research this further. Kimberly, that will be available through um, through COABE. What is your state budget for adult education? We went from 12.9 and with the increases, it's going to be 4 million more in 23, 24 and 8 million more. So it's total of 12 million across two years. But we were at a very pretty you know, 12, 12 ish million. And then our federal was more around, uh, I couldn't tell you the federal, I think it was around nine or 10. Um, where can we find the state rankings of adult basic education? That is available on the NRS National Reporting System website. There is a public access point on NRS National Reporting System. So if you go in there to that site and look at state data, you should be able to find a public pat platform and you can look up from there, Yvonne. I am interested to hear about IEL used in Indiana. 
Um, Lori, that, uh, that is um, a granular level that our IET coordinator, Roy Melton, um, if you want to send me an email, I can forward you that, uh, his contact information, and we can get you that through him. What different measures does Indiana have for attaining MSGs? Jody, we pull all the levers. We do career certifications. We do um, WEI milestones, skills progression, HSEs, ELL. We use TABE Class E, and TABE is our assessment. That is our core assessment. That is what we use at the state level. Um, and I think, Xavier, I may have answered that 45% distance learning goal. That is any type of distance learning. And I think David Rosen, we have, like I said, a lot of latitude at the program levels. We don't really prescribe what the hybrid learning looks like. And oh my goodness, I think we got through all the questions and it is 2.57 p.m. So um, cool, very good. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, James. I'll turn it back over to you guys. Thank you, Laura. What a wonderful presentation. Oh my goodness, so much good information. Um, I will answer this one repeat question live, just so everybody gets it before you log off. The presentation, the replay, as well as the PowerPoint and all accompanying documents um, that Laura wants to share will be available on coabe.org. Within about 24 hours, you will get an email notification with a link to that. Robert, do you want to say a couple of words before we log off? Bravo, bravo, bravo. That was just just excellent work. And 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 to everybody listening, uh, I, I see so many things around the country where state offices are working so closely with local folks, uh, local directors and staffs. And and I think uh, just hearing what you're doing in Indiana is just one more beacon for the whole country to emulate. So great, great work. Marilyn Pizzullo, direct, State Director, Laura and the entire Jerry and the entire team. So bravo. Excellent. Thank you, Robert. Thank you again for sponsoring today's webinar. Uh, we appreciate it. And thank you, Laura. And thank you, everyone who joined us today. I hope everybody has a great rest of their day and a great rest of their week. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you.